Hello, STAT 200, and welcome to Lesson 8. This is the first of two lessons on hypothesis testing. Lessons 8 and 9 are going to follow a structure similar to 6 and 7. In Lesson 6, you learn how to construct confidence intervals using simulations, specifically bootstrapping methods. And then in Lesson 7, you learned how to apply the central limit theorem and the rule of sample proportions to construct confidence intervals using the Z or T distribution. Similarly, in Lesson 8, we're going to use simulations again, this time randomization methods. And then in Lesson 9, next week, we'll use formulas to conduct the same test. If you've never taken a statistics course before, you're probably wondering, what is hypothesis testing? Hypothesis testing is a method for testing the likelihood that an observed sample came from a population with a given parameter. So in the previous two lessons, when you did confidence intervals, you were trying to estimate a population parameter given an observed sample. Hypothesis testing is different because now we have a hypothesized population parameter, and we want to know how likely it is that our sample came from a population with that hypothesized parameter value. Here are some possible research questions that we can address using hypothesis testing this week. Is the mean age of all World Campus students greater than 32? In other words, is the population mean mu greater than 32? Later, we'll see that this is known as an alternative hypothesis. Do more than 50% of World Campus students live in Pennsylvania? In other words, does the population proportion, or P, greater than 0.50? Let's compare hypothesis testing to confidence intervals. When you constructed a confidence interval, you are estimating an unknown population parameter using an observed sample. This week, in hypothesis testing, you're going to determine whether the observed sample likely came from a population with a given parameter. In the last two lessons for confidence intervals, first we used bootstrapping methods. Bootstrapping methods may be used to construct a sampling distribution. If assumptions are met, then the sampling distribution can be estimated by a T or Z distribution. So in Lesson 6, you learn how to construct a sampling distribution using bootstrapping methods. And then in Lesson 7, you learn the more traditional methods. In those cases, there were assumptions for uh, sample mean. You had to have a sample size of at least 30, or you had to know that the population was normally distributed. For a proportion, n times p and n times 1 minus p, both had to be at least 10. In those cases, you could use the traditional method that based the sampling distribution on a t or a z distribution. Similarly, in hypothesis testing, first we're going to use randomization methods. Randomization methods may be used to construct a sampling distribution. Constructing a sampling distribution using randomization methods is very similar to constructing one using bootstrapping methods, only now we have a hypothesized population parameter, so we're going to center our sampling distribution on that hypothesized value. Next week, we'll see that if assumptions are met, then again the sampling distribution can be estimated by a T or a Z distribution. These are the key topics that we're going to cover this week. First, you're going to conduct a randomization test for one sample proportion and one sample mean. You'll learn how to do this in both StatKey and Minitab Express. Then at the end of this lesson, you'll learn how to identify type 1 and type 2 errors in hypothesis testing, and you'll distinguish between statistical and practical significance. Just like in bootstrapping that you learned in Lesson 6, Randomization methods can be used to simulate a sampling distribution. Like bootstrapping, many samples are drawn from the observed sample with replacement. The difference between bootstrapping and randomization is that randomization distributions are constructed under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. 
And shortly, we're going to see how to write null and alternative hypotheses based on a research question. But now, know that we have a hypothesized population proportion or a hypothesized population mean, and we're going to center our sampling distribution on that value. The first step before even running the randomization test is to write your hypotheses. You're going to write a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is H sub O, or H sub naught, the null hypothesis always contains an equality. The alternative hypothesis, or H sub A, sometimes you'll also see this written as H subscript 1, will never contain an equality. It will contain greater than, less than, or not equal to. In the null hypothesis, the population parameter is equal to the hypothesized value. The research question is typically stated in terms of the alternative hypothesis, where the population parameter is greater than, less than, or different from a hypothesized value. In order to write hypotheses, you need three pieces of information. One, the parameter. Are you dealing with a proportion or a mean in this lesson? If you're dealing with a proportion, then your population parameter is P, the population proportion. If you're dealing with a quantitative variable, then your parameter is mu, the population mean. If you're reading the LOC5 textbook, note that they introduce single sample tests that we're dealing with this week, and two sample tests and correlation, which we won't see for another two or three weeks, all in the same chapter. So the procedures for all of these randomization tests are exactly the same. This week and next week, we're just going to focus on single sample tests, though. So the first piece of information that you need is the parameter, which this week, like I said, will be P or mu. The second piece of information you need is the direction. So this is the direction of the alternative hypothesis. You'll get this from your research question. Do we want to know if the population mean or proportion is greater than a given value, less than a given value, or different from? A given value. That will determine the sign in the alternative hypothesis. And the third piece of information that you need is the hypothesized value. This value should be given to you in the research question or if you're given a scenario. Let's look at a few examples of writing hypotheses. Here's our first research question. Is the mean age of all world campus students greater than 32? First, we need to determine our parameter. Is it a proportion or is it a mean? Well, the research question clearly states that this is a mean. So our parameter is going to be mu. The direction of the test is going to be a right tail test because we want to know if the mean is greater than 32. The hypothesized value is 32. So we put these three pieces of information together we get mu is greater than 32. We have to write a null and an alternative hypothesis. Remember, the null always contains the equality. So the null hypothesis is going to be that mu equals 32. And the alternative is going to be that mu is greater than 32. These are the null and alternative hypotheses that we would then use to run our randomization test. This is a right-tailed test because we want to know if the population parameter is greater than 32. So we're looking at the high end or the right end of our sampling distribution here. Here's another example. Do more than 50% of world campus students live in Pennsylvania? Our parameter is going to be P because we're looking at a percentage which will convert to a proportion. The direction Again, this is going to be a right tail test because we want to know if the population proportion is greater than a given value. And the hypothesized value is going to be 0 0.50 because we're going to convert this percentage into a proportion. We put these three pieces of information together and we get P is greater than 0 0.50. The null hypothesis contains an equality. The alternative hypothesis contains 
greater than, less than, or not equal to. What we have here is an alternative hypothesis, and the null hypothesis would be that p equals 0 0.50. This is another example of a right-tailed test because we want to know if the population parameter is greater than a given value. And one last example is the average height of a female high school senior different from 62 inches. The research question is asking about an average, so our population parameter is going to be mu, the population mean. We're not given a specific direction, so we're not told greater than or less than. Uh, we just want to know if the mean is different from 62, so this is going to be a two-tailed test, or someone call this a non-directional test. The hypothesized value is 64. We put these values together and we get mu is not equal to 64. This is our alternative hypothesis because the null hypothesis must contain the equality. This is a two-tailed test or a non-directional test. When we do a two-tailed randomization test in StatKeep, you'll see that we need to take into account both the left and the right side of the sampling distribution because our research question doesn't give us any clue as to whether the mean should be greater than and on the right side of the distribution or less than and on the left side of the distribution. So we'll take into account um, the left side and the right side of the sampling distribution. Now that we have our hypotheses written, we can construct a randomization distribution, which we'll use to determine the probability that our sample came from a population with the given or hypothesized parameter. To do this, we shift the observed sample so that the sample proportion or sample mean is equal to the value in the null hypothesis. So this randomization distribution is constructed under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. Then we take random samples with replacement. So this step is the same as it was for bootstrapping in lesson six. Finally, to determine statistical significance, we find the area in the randomization distribution that is more extreme than the observed sample statistic in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. Let's walk through a few examples of these. We'll go back to a research question that we saw earlier. Do more than 50% of world campus students live in Pennsylvania? We have the hypotheses that we wrote. This is a right-tailed test. So after we construct our sampling distribution, we're only going to look at the right side. Here are our sample data. In a sample of 30 world campus students, 18 were living in Pennsylvania. Let's go to StatKey to conduct this randomization test. In StatKey, we are conducting a randomization hypothesis test for a single proportion. We can edit our data. Recall we said 18 out of 30 in our observed sample for Pennsylvania residents. And we want to know if the population proportion is greater than 0 0.50. Our null hypothesis was that p equals 0 0.50. You can change this null value, but in this case, the default is aligned with the null hypothesis that we have. Here we can see our original sample, 18 out of 30, gives us a sample proportion of 0 0.600. We can generate one randomization sample. So here we have in our first randomization sample 13 out of 30. We keep taking randomization samples. Take a thousand. We should center on the, the value in the null hypothesis. So here I have just over 5,000 samples. The sample mean is 0 0.501 which is approximately equal to 0 0.50, the value in our null hypothesis. So that's the primary difference between bootstrapping and randomization sampling distributions. 
we are no longer centered on the original sample proportion, we are centered on the null value. We wanted to know if the sample proportion was greater than 0 0.50. So remember, we were conducting a right tail test. If we check the right tail box, the default is if you do a two tail test to do um, a 5% total, if you do left tail or right tail, 5% total gives you 2.5% in each tail. This is just the default value. You need to change the cutoff at the bottom. The cutoff down here should match the original sample proportion because we want to know the proportion of this curve that is more extreme than the value we observed in our sample. The value we observed in our sample, again, is 0 0.600. This area, the area that's highlighted in red now, is the area under the sampling distribution that is equal to or more extreme than the value observed in our sample. Number up here tells you this area. So this is 0 0.188 or 18.8% of the sampling distribution. This is the p-value. To interpret this value, we could say that given the null hypothesis was true, so given that the population proportion was 0 0.50, 18.8% of samples would have a sample proportion as extreme or more extreme than the one observed in our sample. In hypothesis testing, you're typically going to compare this value to 0.05. That's what's known as the standard alpha level. So if the p-value is greater than 0.05, or whatever the specified alpha level is, then we say that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, in this particular case, there is not evidence that our sample came from a population with a proportion greater than 0 0.50. Because if the population proportion was really 0 0.50, more than 18% of samples would have a sample proportion greater than or equal to the one that we observed. This same test can be run in Minitab Express. We'll run a randomization test for one sample proportion using summarized data, 18 out of 30, our hypothesized proportion value was 0 0.50, and we had a right tail test, so our alternative hypothesis was that P is greater than the hypothesized value of 0 0.50. We run this in Minitab Express, um, and the p-value, again, is the red shaded area, which in this case is 0 0.1970. If we scroll down, it'll show us the null alternative hypothesis, so you should double check that the null alternative hypothesis that Minitab Express is testing is the same one that you wrote before you ran the test. And then we have our p-value of 0 0.1970, which is similar to the 1.88 that we found using StatKey. In both cases, this p-value is relatively large. We would fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is not evidence that the population proportion is greater than 0 0.50. Let's move on to another example involving a mean. Is the mean ideal marriage age, as reported by World Campus students, different from 27 years? So the research question is asking, is mu not equal to 27? The null hypothesis must always contain the equality, so the null is going to be mu equals 27, and our alternative will be what the research question is asking, so mu is not equal to 27. This is an example of a two-tailed test.
because we're not given a specific direction. We're going to use data from the spring 17 data.mtw file. So let me open this data file in Minitab Express, and then we'll go to stat key to run this randomization test. So in Minitab Express, this question is coded as best marriage age. I'm going to copy this, and then in stat key, we're going to conduct a randomization hypothesis test for a single mean. There are a number of data sets built into StatKey, but we're going to be using the one from, that includes data that were collected at the beginning of this semester. So we'll edit data, delete the existing data set, and paste the data set that I just copied from Minitab Express. Looks like there's a blank row at the top that I can delete. We click OK. Now our original sample includes the responses from 496 World Campus students from the beginning of this semester. Here we have our sample mean, median, and standard deviation. Our null hypothesis was that mu equals 27. So we'll change that value to 27. I'll generate one Example. We can see that Minitab Express has changed what should be the center of the distribution to the null value of 27. I'll take a few more samples. Uh, and you can see how it's adjusting because here these values were 95 and 100. Now they're 93.808 and 98.808. So that difference between 100 and 98.808 is the difference between our sample mean and the null mean. So it's taking this sample and it's, it's adjusting it so that the mean is shifted to, to 27 when it's taking the randomization sample. Let's take a few thousand samples. Here we have our sampling distribution with a little over 5,000 samples. The mean is 26.999, which is very similar to the, the null value of 27. And we have our standard error. This was a two-tailed test. The default in stat key is to give you the middle 95 versus the outer 5%. We need to change the, the value on the bottom now so that it matches our observed sample mean. When you're doing a two-tailed test, you need to make sure that you change the correct value. If you change the wrong value, if you get the opposite side, it's going to tell you that the p-value is 1, which is, is not possible. So it's important that you get the correct side here to change. So our observed sample mean was 28.192. 28 28.192 would fall over here on the right side so we're going to change the value on the right side to 28.192. And again, this number is coming from the original sample. Because we want to identify the proportion of sample means that are more extreme than the one that we observed in our original sample. And here we can see there was 0.000 on the right side, 0, 0.000 on the left side. Typically, we would add these two together. 0 plus 0 equals 0. Theoretically, it's not possible for the p-value to equal 0. What we would say is that the p-value is less than 0 0.0001. So it's a very small p-value. In other words, if the null hypothesis were true, so if the population mean really is 27, a very, very small percentage of samples would have a sample mean of 28.192 or more extreme. So it's very unlikely that our sample would come from this population. In this case, we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. And we would conclude that there is evidence that the population mean is different 
from 27. These results would be said to be statistically significant. So when the p-value is small, you reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis, and your results are statistically significant. Let's run through this example in Minipad Express as well. Under resampling, we're going to select randomization test for one sample mean. Best marriage age is our variable. The hypothesized mean was 27. This was a two-tailed test, so we can use the default alternative hypothesis. And again, Minitab Express is telling us that the p-value is less than 0.002. This is a very small p-value. It is very unlikely that our sample came from a population with a mean of 27, so we reject the null hypothesis. There is evidence that the population mean is different from 27. There are a few examples of these randomization tests from start to finish in your online notes. If you have any questions as you're working through these or if you're looking for specific examples, please ask on the Lesson 8 discussion board in Canvas. There's two more topics that we need to cover for this lesson, though. The first is errors, so errors in hypothesis testing. When we're conducting a hypothesis test, we only have data from a sample. If we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis, there's, there's two possibilities here. Either we made a correct decision and in reality the null hypothesis is false, or we made a type 1 error. When we fail to reject the null hypothesis, again, either we made a correct decision or we, we could have possibly made a type 2 error. So a type 1 error occurs if we reject the null hypothesis, but the null hypothesis is really true. A type 2 error occurs when we fail to reject the null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis is really false. In most situations, we don't know the reality. If we knew the reality and we knew the population parameter values, then we wouldn't be doing hypothesis testing. We would have those population parameters and we wouldn't need inferential statistics. But type 1 and type 2 error are important because we use these values when we're setting our alpha levels or when we're discussing the power of a test. So a type 1 error is also known as an alpha error. You heard me talk earlier that we compare the p-value to the alpha level of a test. The alpha level of a test is the highest or the most tolerable level of a type 1 error that you're willing to put up with in a given test. Typically, uh, alpha is set at 0 0.05. So we're saying that we're willing to take 5% chance of making a type 1 error. Your textbook does a really good job of explaining situations in which you might want to change the alpha level. So for example, if you're doing a research study involving medication, and if you reject the null hypothesis when it's really true, so if you say there's a difference when there's not a difference, then you could make people really sick, or you could cost someone a lot of money. Some cases where making a type 1 error is, is much worse than making a type 2 error, in those cases, you might want to use a very small alpha level. So you might want to be really sure that the null hypothesis is false before you reject it. Other cases, for example, if you're doing a pilot study, you might not worry so much about type 1 error. You might just want to get an idea of um, the practical significance, which we'll see next. Pilot studies usually use a larger alpha level, maybe 0 0.10, or I think I've even seen 0 0.15 or 0 0.20. Those are really large alpha levels and should only be used for pilot tests where the, the conclusion is, is not really being used to make a real life decision. It's just being used to inform future research studies. So let's look at an example. 
earlier, we looked at um, these hypotheses. We wanted to know if there was evidence that the mean ideal marriage age in the population of world campus students was different from 27. Recall, we rejected the null hypothesis. We had a very small p-value. So we rejected the null. Let's say that a later census, so a census uh, is, is when data are collected from the entire population. So a later census showed that the population mean is really 27 years. In this case, we rejected the null hypothesis, but in reality, the null hypothesis was true. We committed a type 1 error. Here's another example. We tested these hypotheses, p equals 0 0.50 versus p is greater than 0 0.50. We found a p-value greater than 0 0.05, and this might be a good time for me to point out that p in the hypotheses means population proportion, but p in terms of p-value is the, the probability of obtaining results as extreme or more extreme, given that the null hypothesis is true. So I know this gets a little confusing because you have p in the hypotheses and you have p and p-value. These are different p's. We failed to reject the null hypothesis. Let's say that a later census showed that the population proportion is 0 0.60. In other words, the null hypothesis is really false. The alternative hypothesis is really true. We made a type 2 error. The last thing that we need to talk about this week is statistical significance versus practical significance. When we're conducting a hypothesis test, we are testing statistical significance. We're answering the question, is it likely that the observed sample came from a population with the hypothesized parameter? We measure this by comparing the p-value to the alpha level. Results are either statistically significant or not statistically significant, right? You reject the null hypothesis or you fail to reject the null hypothesis. This is different from practical significance. In practical significance, we want to know is the difference between this sample and the hypothesized parameter meaningful? This is measured as an effect size. Effect size is really big in the social sciences. So if you're reading journal articles, for example, in psychology, almost all of the, the recent articles are going to give you an effect size. This is some measure of the difference between the observed sample and the hypothesized population. Or in a few weeks, we'll, we'll be comparing two different groups. In that case, it'd be a measure of how different are those two groups. So statistical significance is, are they different, yes or no? And practical significance is, how different are they? Statistical significance is heavily influenced by the sample size. So you know from previous weeks, the larger the sample size, the smaller the standard error. Well, the smaller the standard error, the smaller the p-value. The larger the sample size, the more likely your results are going to be statistically significant. If you have a very large sample size, just about any difference, even the smallest differences, will be statistically significant. So in addition to looking at statistical significance, you should also be paying attention to practical significance. So is the difference that you're observing meaningful, or is it a very small difference that is statistically significant because your sample size is very large? So it's possible for a result to be statistically significant, but not practically significant. And you'll see an example of this on the lab assignment this week. This concludes the Lesson 8 overview. As always, if you have any questions as you're working through the content this week, please post them on the Lesson 8 discussion board in Canvas.